Here. Here. Okay, good evening, everyone. We have um, six bills to vote on this evening. Senate Bill 2112 and Senate Bill 2233 have been postponed. Senate 2112 and 2233. Uh, we also have five marriage solemnization bills. Why don't we start with that? Motion to bundle, Chairman. Vice Chair Costa moves to bundle. That's seconded by Representative Blazajewski. All in favor? Aye. Okay, they will be bundled. Uh, move passage of the bundle, Chairman. Vice Chair Costa moves passage as bundled. That's seconded by Representative Blazajewski. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Okay, those bills will go to the floor. Next, we have six bills uh, for consideration. First is House Bill 7200 by Lita D. Simone. This is a uh, statutory construction bill. Uh, Council, we do have a sub A. Could you explain the nature of that? Yes, thank you. This is the statutory construction bill for 2016. Previously, this year passed 2015. The sub A makes changes on page one, uh, addressing section 219.3 and 3511. Uh, it just changes words, for example, from they to each she or it. Also, on um, uh, it changes another section where the Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act on page 15 now is stated as the Servicemen's Relief Act. Any other changes to statutes of grammatical in nature and or corrections of typos relative to either a statute or a site? Okay, I will entertain a motion. Indefinite postponement of original and move passage of the sub A chairman. Okay, Vice Chair Costa moves to indefinitely postpone the original bill and passage of substitute A. That is seconded by Representative Blazajewski. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Okay, House Bill 7200, substitute A passes. Let's next take up House Bill 7406 by Chairman Craven. This is an Attorney General bill. Council, we have a substitute A on this as well? Crimes bill uh, addressing confidential information from computers. On page 2, lines 23 to 27, the definition of confidential information was tightened up uh, to add uh, language relative to any business, nonprofit, or government entity computer with uh, protected information. And on page 4, um, under the section unauthorized access, access to confidential information, they added the words directly or indirectly accessing a computer in order to get confidential information. That, those are the changes that have been made relative to the sub -A. Okay, thank you, Council. I will entertain a motion. Uh, uh, indefinite postponement of original and move passage of sub -A, Chairman. Okay, Vice Chair Costa moves to indefinitely postpone the original bill and passage of Substitute A. That is seconded by Representative Canario. Is there any discussion? Yes, Representative Flippy. Uh, I just have concerns that this could apply to a parent searching their child's computer, and for that reason I'm going to vote no. Thank you, sir. Okay. Representative Vigello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for similar reasons, having received a very long letter from the Electronic Frontier Foundation just today, I'm going to abstain on this bill for now. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Representative Filippi in opposition. Representative Agello abstaining from voting. The bill does pass, and that will move to the House floor. Let us next take up House Bill 7542 by Representative Ackerman. This, too, comes from the Attorney General's office. It would include online impersonation and electronic dissemination of indecent materials to minors as offenses for which an Internet service provider must give subscriber information to the Attorney General. Move passage, Chairman. Vice Chair Costa moves passage. That's seconded by Representative Blazajewski. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? House Bill 7542 passes. Next, let's take up House Bill 7999 by myself. This uh, would provide that the amount forfeited 
to the court is limited to 10% of a surety deposit for bonds people. I move passage. Second. That's seconded by, represent, uh, by Vice Chair Costa. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? House Bill 7999 passes. Next, let's take up Senate Bill 2102 by Senator Lombardi. This is an exact duplicate of Chairman Craven's bill, House Bill 7445, that was voted out of committee on May 10th and is scheduled for a floor vote on May 19th. It would allow conveyances to and from nominee trust. Move passage, Chairman. Vice Chair Costa moves passage. That's seconded by Representative Craven. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay, Senate Bill 2102 passes. Uh, Senate Bill, as I said earlier, 2112 is postponed, as is 2233. Let's next take up Senate Bill 2596, Substitute A by Senator Goodwin. This is an exact duplicate of uh, lead, uh, Speaker Mattiello's bill, House Bill 7002, Substitute A, passed the floor on April 13th by a vote of 71 to 0. Move passage, Chairman. Vice Chair Costa moves passage. That's seconded by Representative Filippi. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, Senate Bill 2596, Substitute A, passes. With that, we have two bills remaining to hear. Motion to hold for further study, Chairman. Vice Chair Costa moves to hold those bills for further study. That is seconded by Representative Blazajewski. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Those bills will be held for further study. We have two bills on tonight. One is House Bill 8189 by Speaker Mattiello, and the other is House Bill 7577 by Representative Marcello. The witnesses signed up for these two bills are nearly identical, so we are going to hear them together. I believe the speaker is going to welcome speaker. We're just about to take up your bill, House Bill 8189. Speaker Mattiello. Thank you, Chair. You may. Thank you, Chairman Keeble. And Honorable members of this committee. First, I want to thank you for all of your hard work. This is certainly one of the hardest working committees putting in the longest hours uh, in the General Assembly, and I, I want to thank you for serving our citizens so well. The importance of the proposed legislation cannot be understated. If approved by the General Assembly, this legislation would put a question before the voters to narrow the scope of the speech and debate clause. And it would once again provide jurisdiction to the Ethics Commission to investigate and prosecute complaints against General Assembly members. Amendments to our Constitution should be considered very carefully, as we have done. When I first became Speaker, uh, I think the primary focus was jobs and the economy. Our unemployment rate was too high, too many people were, not, were out of work, and that's where our priority had to be. And I think the general public supported that priority. However, even though we still have a lot of work to do, we are transitioning um, from an absolute concentration on only jobs in the economy to looking at some constitutional changes which will serve our constituency very, very, very well. I personally have given this issue a lot of thought, a lot of consideration, and given it a lot of research, as I know a lot of you have also. And I thank you for that, and I thank you for your collaboration on this very important issue. It could not be clearer that the time is now to restore Ethics Commission oversight over the General Assembly. The public and we have to be convinced that as we deliberate, as we take up issues, as we propose initiatives to serve the public, that we ourselves are free of conflicts of interest.
from my own point of view, it's discouraging, it's concerning, it's maddening, frustrating that individuals sometimes act inappropriately and with a conflict of interest when all of you are working so hard on behalf of our constituents. I know that I, as well as each one of you, comes to the State House each and every day to serve your, your districts, your constituents, and the State of Rhode Island in the most honest, hardworking way you can. And I've always said, I don't know of any conflicts of interest up here, because I know the integrity with which each one of you serves. However, we've learned recently that some folks do breach the public trust, and it's unfair, number one, to the public, number two, to the institution we, we all serve and love, and to each of us individually, to be cast with the same brush as everybody else. And it's unfair because it distracts us from the service that we want to provide to our constituencies, the citizens of the state of Rhode Island. I and you have spent an inordinate amount of time recently dealing with problems that are caused when people put their personal interest over the public interest. And we, we cannot allow that anymore. So although Everybody that I know, and I can still say this to this day, everybody that I know I believe works hard, works selflessly to serve the public interest to the extent that some folks breach the public trust and put self-interest over public good, we need an independent body to check for conflicts of interest and to provide oversight for conflicts of interest. We cannot allow outrageous events, self-interest, to distract us from our primary work. And that's to make sure that we promote our economy, promote the social good, promote any and all interest of our constituencies. So, it's imperative that we give another body, the Ethics Commission, the oversight of conflicts of interest, and that there be a supervising body other than, other than ourselves. I've indicated that when I became Speaker, we were concentrating on jobs in the economy. In the last four years, we've reduced our unemployment rate from 10.9% to 5.4. We basically cut it in half. More people are working, and we are moving in the right direction. But please don't misconstrue my statements. Moving in the right direction means our trajectory is good. It doesn't mean we're nearly where we have to get. We have a lot more work to do, and we have to continue that work until people feel as though their income is keeping up with the effort they put into their livelihood and their standard of living is appropriate to, to maintain and support their families. Along those lines, and when you're looking at jobs in the economy, it's always going to hold a state back if businesses don't feel that General Assembly members are working, are not working free of conflicts of interest, and they're promoting the public good and not their own good, and that there's not corruption in government. So in order to give the business community, as well as our citizens, and our citizens are primary, but is to, in order to give the business community that confidence that there is an independent body that's going to be providing oversight, our economy is never going to be as good as it should be. And I believe that, first of all, the best social program is a great job, and that what ultimately drives the mood, the feeling, the decisions of the electorate is their standard of living, is their job, is their ability to 
feed their, and support their family. Everything is derived from your ability to take care of your family. So our policies will stay concentrated on jobs in the economy, and we're going to make sure that we provide the opportunity for the citizens to vote on the ethics bill that's before you, should you pass it, to limit the, the scope of the speech and debate clause and to once again provide oversight to the Ethics Commission. We have one of the toughest ethics codes and ethics commissions in the country. I believe that it is the only ethics commission that can adopt rules and enforce those rules. And that's appropriate. And we're maintaining that in this legislation. The one difference from simply restoring ethics oversight as it was prior to 2009, the Irons decision, and today, is that we're putting in, we're suggesting a moratorium that I ask you to consider. And that's a moratorium just to take politics out of it, because one of one of the concerns that I hear most frequently is that people are concerned, and, and I hear this on both sides of the aisle, that the Ethics Commission is somehow politicized at election time. And that concern, I'm going to repeat myself, comes from both sides of the aisle. It's unfair to the public. It's unfair to elect, elected officials or people running for public office. And it's unfair to the Ethics Commission because they work hard and they do a good job providing oversight for the citizens of this state. And they do a good job for us, giving us advice and providing us with decisions to guide us in our decisions. So, but despite the good job that they do, partisan politics is what partisan politics is and always will be. It's not fair, it's not always right, and it's not always honest. I believe that the, well, someone just did, and I forget if it was Common Cause or the Ethics Commission themselves, an analysis of the complaints filed each month to the Ethics Commission. In October and November, before elections, they receive on average 18 complaints per month. All other months, it's 19.7. There is a 100% spike in complaints just before election time. That is uncontroverted evidence that the Ethics Commission is being used for political partisan purposes. And that's wrong and inappropriate. It's wrong to the good people that stand up and want to represent their communities for the most noble reasons. And they're faced with the frivolous complaint. Doesn't serve proper oversight function. Doesn't serve the public good. It doesn't serve to encourage good people to run for offices to having the, and it doesn't serve the good will and the good name of the Ethics Commission and the good work that the Ethics Commission does to have the Ethics Commission used for partisan political purposes. So to serve the public good, to encourage good people to run, To encourage good people to run, to take politics out of conflicts oversight, which on its face for the right reasons is very good, there's a moratorium suggested in this legislation so that from the day someone declares for office, declaration period through the election, there are no complaints. All other times the jurisdiction goes back exactly as it was prior to the Irons decision. And I'm informed I misspoke, so I apologize if I did. October and November, before elections, 18 percent, 18 complaints 
filed on average each month. All other months, 9.7. If I said 19.7, I'm sorry, 9.7. So it goes from 9.7 in all other months to the two months before election, 18% a 100% increase in complaints during that period. Unquestionably, complaints are being filed for partisan political purposes at election time. That's inappropriate. The only way I know to address that is a moratorium. And that moratorium serves all of the right purposes that we want to encourage, encourage people to run for office, encourage appropriate complaints to the, the Ethics Commission, while having appropriate Ethics Commission oversight. I think it's imperative at this time that we send a strong message that we will not tolerate self-interest over public interest, self-interest over public good. Where we see it, we must condemn it. Where we see it, we must shine a light upon it and, and make sure that it's stopped and prevented. And having an independent ethics commission providing conflicts of interest oversight will be a wonderful, strong, appropriate first step for us to take. And I believe that's going to go a long way in restoring public trust in our government. And ultimately, we're here to serve the public good and to provide for public needs, not personal needs. So I thank you for taking the time to listen to me, for allowing me to testify. I thank you for all of your hard work all year. It is certainly noticed by myself and all of your colleagues and I believe the, the general public, so thank you for that. After a period of study and deliberation, as you do on every bill before you, I ask you to pass House Bill 8189 out to the floor for consideration for the entire House for all of the reasons that I previously mentioned. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Speaker Matteo. <clears throat> Speaker Matteo, are there any questions for the sponsor? Thank you very much for joining us in Judiciary, and thank you for bringing us this very important bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. Representative Marcello, you have House Bill 5, I'm sorry, 7577. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, I'm, here, I'm here once again, as I have been every year since 2011, seeking your support of a resolution uh, this year numbered H7577, which seeks to, to ask the voters if they wish to amend their constitution to reinstate Ethics Commission oversight over all elected and appointed officials, including the 113 members of the General Assembly. I also want to thank the uh, co-sponsors of this bill who have been with me from the very beginning. Uh, Representative Hearn, Representative Constantino, Representative uh, Sicarci, and Representative Agello, among, among other, many others who have s supported this bill since 2011. It was pretty easy, Mr. Chairman, to prepare for this hearing today since I have prepared for similar hearings since 2011. And luckily, I saved some of my prior testimony, which it turns out uh, appears to be both timely and timeless. Here are some of the highlights of what I said to this committee for the last five years that I have been the main sponsor of the ethics bill. From 1986 until 2009, a period of years, the Ethics Commission, at the specific request of the citizenry of the, excuse me, citizenry of the state of Rhode Island, did its job with little or no complaint from anyone and without any evidence of abuse or malice. 
They simply executed the law as mandated until the Rhode Island Supreme Court in 2009 held by a vote of four to one that the Ethics Commission could not question a legislator over his or her his or her core legislative acts because of a conflict with another provision of the Rhode Island Constitution, the Speech and Debate Clause. The people of the state of Rhode Island deserve the right to weigh in on this issue again. They deserve the chance to vote on a constitutional amendment to bring us back to 1986, to ask them specifically, should the Ethics Commission regain the power that they were given by the people, but later taken away by an in interpretation by the Rhode Island Supreme Court? I believe it gets to the core of the nature of representative government, that the people have the power to alter or amend their governing documents, their constitution, whenever they feel that government is not serving their interests. It is a concept embedded in the Declaration of Independence. With the recent scandals that have again overshadowed this house, can anyone truly say that government is serving the interests of the people who sent us here? In order to improve our business climate, we must improve our ethical climate. They are not separate spheres of influences, and we must and can do both. If you were a business interested in coming to our great city, would you want to relocate here knowing that the General Assembly was accepted, expected to be self-monitoring after years of scandal and shame? The people of the state of Rhode Island deserve the right to impose as many ethical requirements on their appointed or elected officials as they deem fit since we are all supposed to serve the interests, their interests, and not our own. Mr. Chairman, I, can go, I could go on from past testimony, but let me uh, now add uh, what I believe I said, excuse me, I could go on, on from past testimony, but let me now add to what, I said, to what I have said in the past with some words for the future. Our citizens have a right to expect high standards of their elected officials and the watchful eyes of a re-empowered ethics commission which just may deter some elected officials, no matter where they serve, from skirting the ethical line. We do not provide a blackout period for someone who takes a bribe or tries to extort a privilege or a job. We should not impose a blackout period by a constitutional amendment on any unethical behavior, especially in light of the dark, sh dark shadows that have fallen on this house. We are not running a frequent flyer program for the airline. We are charged with running the legislative branch of government, and there should be no safe harbor given which impedes the ability of the Ethics Commission to do what the voters first asked them to do in 1986, police the boundaries of ethical government conduct. Well, Representative Marcello, just to be clear, it's not a blackout of behavior. It's not like if you do something bad in that period, you're okay. It's just you can't make the complaint during that period, right? It, yes, it okay. is, it, I just yes, wanna... yes, it is true, but again, we, we, the, the Ethics Commission operated fine without a blackout period. I'm sure you have testimony on that. Uh, I have no illusions tonight that my resolution will, not, will pass this committee, given the fact that the competing resolution is sponsored by the Speaker and the Majority Leader. Except for the blackout period, the resolutions are nearly identical, but most importantly, achieve what I and I believe the majority of Rhode Islanders have been clamoring for since 2009. I welcome both the Speaker and the House Leadership Team to this debate a debate that has gone on for far too long. The seven year wait to pass an ethical resolution has only served to erode confidence in this institution to the point that we now have no choice but to do something. We all need to ask ourselves, what took us so long? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, any questions for the sponsor of House Bill 7577? Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Representative Vigello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Marcello, uh, I have been happy to co-sponsor this legislation with you over the years. D and you are troubled by the blackout clause during a campaign period. Do you know if any other states have such a blackout period? I believe other states do. I don't know off the top of my, my head how many. I, would, I was not aware of the statistics that were just given to you by the speaker, which I have no uh, reason to doubt. But if you, the legislation as proposed now, first of all, would constitutionalize a blackout period where I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. But even if you're going to do a blackout period, the testimony that you just heard indicates that there's a spike in uh, complaints in October, uh, October, November, right before the actual election occurs. This blackout period begins from the date that you declare, which is the end of June, until the day after the election. So at the very least, if you're going to go with a blackout period, which, you know, I, I can understand some of the policy considerations of it, but I would certainly think that you need to, if you're going to go that, get, go that route, you need to shorten it. 
uh, that's, it's, you're, out, you're in a five-month period. Uh, and again, I believe the Ethics Commission can deal with frivolous complaints. They have. If you want to try to discourage frivolous complaints, you can, you can maybe up the penalties for filing a frivolous complaint. Uh, you know, I, I, there's other ways to get the, out the concerns about filing fr frivolous complaints, trying to influence an election uh, by, other than a blackout period. And, 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 and on, the, on the flip side of that, I also think that if you're a, a current office holder and, and if your opponent, and we're all big boys and girls, I understand how the election process works, but if your opponent starts, says, you know, Representative Jello, isn't it true that you did this, X, Y, and Z, uh, and you voted on a bill that directly benefited you and your neighbors or your friends or your family, and he, makes these, he or she makes those allegations against you, well, the only response that you can do is to respond in public. You can't say, well, it's in the Ethics Commission. The, you know, you don't have protection of the Ethics Commission who could deal with the frivolous complaint on an, in, in a quick basis, hopefully, and say, you know what, it's in the Ethics Commission. They'll make the final determination. This is nothing but petty politics. And you have no opportunity to clear your name within that period because the Ethics Commission can't even hear the case. So I just remind you that we've, we've done pretty well without a blackout period since 1986, and the voters of the state who imposed the Ethics Commission upon us, again, it's their constitution, it's not our constitution, uh, did not have a blackout, blackout period. And I do think if you're going to go that route, uh, I think you should really seriously think of going another route uh, other than um, a constitutional amendment. Maybe it's something they could, they could tweak um, through their rulemaking power. It gives them a lot more flexibility to, to, for them to react to circum circumstances. Thank you. Any other questions for the sponsor? Thank you, Representative Marcello. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your courtesies. Thank you. Could the committee hear from Phil West, Jr.? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Phil West. I served for 18 years as director of Common Cause. I'm not speaking for Common Cause today, but on the basis of my own analysis, I'm also part of Clean Rhode Island, which is a coalition working toward this ethics reform. I want to start by saying that both Representative Marcello's repeated introduction of this legislation and the speaker's uh, hard work on it this spring are priceless to the state and we are moving in the right direction. We need to celebrate that together. Um, I believe that uh, the speaker's bill is the one that will obviously pass. I'm not uh, naive. Uh, and I think that it, there's a lot of good in that bill, and I want to speak to some of that good, uh, and then uh, some of the specifics that are there. I think that th this creates an opportunity for the General Assembly to do the right thing to let the people vote to restore the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission. And I can't tell you how happy I am to see this moment finally come. The proposed amend both of the proposed amendments, but I'm, I'm speaking now to 8189, the Speaker's Bill, it accomplishes two essential goals from, in, from my perspective. <clears throat> it restores the Ethics Commission's jurisdiction over all public officials in the state of Rhode Island. And second, it preserves the Rhode Island Ethics Commission's unique authority to adopt a code of ethics for all public officials and then to prosecute wrongdoing by any public official in the state. I'd like to mention each of those points briefly and then talk about the blackout question at the end. First, 8189 restores the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission. For seven years, the General Assembly has uh, needed, members of the General Assembly have needed to trust one another because there was no watchdog to deal with ethics violations. And you can't always tell what your neighbors are doing. And that's part of the painful reality of being here, I believe, my experience over 18 years here was that the vast majority of legislators are trying very hard to do the right thing and are honest and trying to avoid conflicts of interest, but sometimes you can't tell what your neighbors are doing. They have been trying to, most legislators, I believe, have been trying to do the right thing without any neutral arbiter 
of conflicts of interest during these seven years. And I think trying to conduct government business without a neutral arbiter of conflicts of interest is like it would be to play professional football without referees. As you pass this resolution, I believe it will be a first step toward bringing the referees back onto the field. Everyone in this place will have a sense that the game is more fair, and the people in the stands all around you will have a sense that the game is more trustworthy, and that will be a good thing. So often in Rhode Island, we're quick to criticize ourselves, and sometimes I hear people out in the community criticizing the legislature as if to say, they're all a bunch of crooks. I hear that a lot. Uh, and the answer to, the, to that that I always say is that's simply wrong. And I would point out to you that we have some of the best process in the country. The speaker and uh, Rep. Marcello uh, alluded to it. In 2013, the Better Government Association in Chicago, for the third time, <clears throat> did a, a state ranking of laws relating to conflicts of interest and open government and several other things, and I can give you the citation of that. And they ranked Rhode Island best in the country, not second, not fifth, not 20th, first in the entire United States. In 2015, the Center for Public Integrity did a, a ranking looking at the Ethics Commission, and they ranked our Ethics Commission first in the United States. I think we can be proud of that. And what you're doing with this resolution that the speaker has put before you today is to finally put that ethics commission, which has been responsible and thorough and careful, back in charge of this most crucial area of your work together. Now, I want to point out that the Irons decision in 2009 made the observation, this, this majority made the observation, that what it would take would be a sufficiently explicit constitutional question before the ballot, uh, before the voters. And I want to suggest that in one small way, the text before you may not be sufficiently explicit on the question of the Ethics Commission's authority. And I, I trust that it is indeed the speaker's intention that it should be sufficiently explicit. And I would ask you to look on page 1, line 15. <clears throat> page 1, line 15, where it says, The Ethics Commission shall have the authority to investigate alleged violations. And I would ask you between investigate and alleged to add two words and adjudicate alleged violations of the Code of Ethics. Very simple change, but it will, be, it will make this text sufficiently explicit to make no question in the mind of any future Supreme Court justice that your intention was to re restore the Ethics Commission's jurisdiction in this area. I'll be glad to answer questions about that in a minute. But let me go ahead and talk about the second thing, which for me has been a primary goal, and that is to restore, the, to, to preserve the Ethics Commission's authority to adopt a code of ethics for public officials. Now, in a word of candor to you, uh, when I spoke to you, Mr. Chairman, and when I've spoken several times with the Speaker, um, there, there have been some who have thought the Ethics Commission should not have that unique authority in the United States to adopt a code of ethics for all public officials. And I have argued strongly that it must, and we should re re retain that. Um, but I, I would say that there, I can understand the arguments on the other side when people say no other ethics commission in the whole country has that authority both to adopt a code of ethics and to prosecute wrongdoing. And you all know, and the members of the public should know, that in Congress and in most other state legislators, legislatures, when there is a complaint filed against a member of a legislature, it is often a committee of the body that makes those decisions. So by agreeing to restore 
the Ethics Commission's authority to adopt a code of ethics uh, sorry, to to adjudicate ethics commission, uh, uh, violations, but also retaining the authority to adopt a code of ethics, you are taking a step forward that w really will be exemplary for the others, other states across the country and indeed for other countries around the world. Now, there's a compromise here that I want to point out, uh, and that is in lines 11 and 12, and that is currently the Ethics Commission uh, approves uh, approves changes in its the, in the rules in the con uh, the code of conduct by a simple majority, and this raises it to a two thirds majority of the members of the commission. I don't believe that some will say, well, they shouldn't do that. I think it's an appropriate change, as I've watched the commission over the years. I've seen the commission approve a number of rules. And most of them have been unanimous or by votes of eight to one or seven to two. And the only time I remember a five to four vote was in May of 2000 when five newly appointed commissioners uh, rejected overwhelming public testimony to um, eviscerate a gift rule. And that was a mistake. They switched from zero tolerance to $150 on an occasion or $450 in a year from any interested party to any public official. And I won't get into that rule now, but I want, I'm simply pointing out that that's the only time I can remember a five to four vote. There may have been others, but that's what I remember. So I think that this raising from a simple majority to two thirds is appropriate. And I think that it will not cause problems in the process of the Ethics Commission, which is careful and deliberative. Just, just to clarify, that is no longer the rule. I'm sorry? Those amounts, that, that is, that, that's no longer the rule. No, it is not. Okay. Uh, I just I, thank you for that. want to clarify that for they, they went perhaps those listening at home. They went back a couple of years later and changed it to $25 an occasion, which I think everybody would recognize as appropriate. And I don't remember what the vote was on that, but it was heavy vote, including some of those who made the wrong vote in 2000. So I'd like to end by making a couple comments about the question of a moratorium. Already we're hearing criticism of this uh, in, on the radio and in other places as if somehow this is an effort to cover up wrongdoing. I, I simply do not believe that that's so. Uh, there are moratoriums like this in other states and I believe that the blackout window simply recognizes that the Ethics Commission cannot investigate a particular complaint in the brief window of a time before an election. And that's really what we're dealing with. What happens when someone files a complaint in September, there's no chance that the Commission can investigate. Common Cause was involved in 1991 in putting the present time limit on that says, the commission must investigate and reach a finding of probable cause within 180 days with two possible extensions for good cause shown. And I think that's a reasonable time limit, but it's simply not going to happen with a complaint that's filed during the election season. And I think that once members of the public and campaign staff and everybody else understand that you can't file an ethics commission uh, complaint during that period, they will still be able to present the facts as they understand them. If they think that Rep. Jello has done some terrible thing, they can go to the press with it, and I'm sure it'll get some coverage. But it won't entangle the Ethics Commission in trying to sort out what that means. And I think that's the difference that we're talking about. This is not an attempt to close off debate or to hide complaints. Now, having said that, I'd like to ask that you, in your wisdom, would take this out of the constitutional amendment because I honestly don't believe that the question of a blackout window, especially with the specifics that are here, deserve to be in the Constitution. The Constitution should be very spare, the fewest possible words. And I would ask you when later witnesses appear, I believe the Ethics Commission is quite prepared to look at this and to pass a rule, or you could do it by statute. And I think either way would be appropriate. It would, it's perfectly within the General Assembly's jurisdiction 
to pass a statute that says this is what the window is going to be. And if you propose such a bill, I will come and support it, and I think many others will. It's the right thing to do to have some kind of a blackout window. But the details are too many and too complicated to put in the Constitution. So I've, say, I've spoken too long, but I'm very grateful for your time, and I'm immensely grateful to all of you and to the speaker for moving this forward. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. West. Any questions? Thank you very much. Could the committee hear from Robert Martinez? Chairman, uh, members of the committee, uh, my name is Robert Martinez. I'm here to speak. I'm here today in support of H8189 and H7577, which is a step in the right direction for government transparency. Ultimately, what citizens are looking for from their legislators is that their best interest is put ahead of personal interest of those put into office to represent us. An ethics commission would benefit the taxpayer who work hard and expect that those sent to represent us here on Smith Hill perform their duties in a manner of ethical behavior. The commission would be a good oversight in light of what has allegedly take, transpired here in the past month. As taxpayers, we just expect our tax dollars, sorry, tax dollars to be spent in a reasonable and responsible manner. And having an ethics commission in place would allow for that transparency to take place. I urge all of you on this committee to ask your fellow legislators and put this bill up for a vote and then on the ballot to, for the voters to have their voices heard in November. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Any questions? Thank you very much, sir. Could we hear from Jason Gramet from the Rhode Island Ethics Commission? Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I want to thank you for your work on this. I uh, also want to thank Speaker Mattiello and the other sponsors, uh, also Rep. Marcello and, and, and his sponsors, and really all of the legislators that have carried ethics legislation through over the last seven years, and all of the people uh, behind me who have testified on this. We're all links in a chain that I hope is getting finished this year, and it seems that it is. It's very exciting for us at the Ethics Commission. I hope it's exciting for you, too. It's a, it's a wonderful time. Um, the Ethics Commission uh, generally tries not to officially support or oppose legislation, especially legislation that is going to uh, increase or decrease its own jurisdiction. It's something that seems a little maybe unethical about that. So what the Ethics Commission does instead and why I'm here today is really to speak about the original intent of the voters in the 1986 Ethics Amendment and opine, uh, give the Commission's opinion as to whether or not these proposals are consistent with that original intent because after all that's what, that's what this resolution would do is send uh, some uh, ballot measures back for the people to clarify their original intent uh, back from 1986. So uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about what the Commission has consistently, not just since the Irons decision, but since before then, has consistently believed are the three real principles that came out of that ethics amendment from the 1986 Constitutional Convention. And, and the first is to create an independent and nonpartisan ethics commission. And so the type of legislation that we would favor or the resolutions we would favor would would keep the Ethics Commission independent and nonpartisan, and uh, it looks as though this resolution would do that. Uh, the second important principle that the Ethics Commission looks at is to make sure that it's an Ethics Commission that has the authority to adopt and enact the Code of Ethics, um, to, to act as a uh, legislative body in some ways to create the Code of Ethics. And, uh, for the reasons that I'll outline in a moment, it seems as if this legislation actually does preserve that also, which is a, a major consideration that the Ethics Commission is always looking at in this type of legislation. And finally, uh, the third issue is 
does the legislation support the people's original intent that the jurisdiction of the commission is over all public officials to enforce the code of ethics. And enforcement meaning the right to investigate violations, to adjudicate violations, and to sanction violations. Uh, the investigative part and the sanctioning part are expressly mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, Phil West mentioned adding the words and adjudicate just to kind of close that final loophole. And I think that's a, a great idea. Uh, I'll talk about that briefly in a moment. So this resolution, uh, Speaker Mattiello's resolution, has a few different moving parts to it. And uh, what I'm here to say is that it seems that each part is consistent with these three issues that I raised before. Uh, it does restore the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission. And it, and it appears to do that in a, an explicit way. It adds a reference to the speech and debate clause to the Ethics Clause. And it adds a reference to the Ethics Clause to the speech and debate clause. Perfect. Uh, a roadmap on each side. Uh, the Ethics Commission does believe that an amendment to add the words and adjudicate would be uh, an important step to ensure that we're not back here in 10 years. Uh, if we really want to fix it once and for all, adding those two words, uh, they certainly add to what you're trying to accomplish. And honestly, I can't think of a single negative, even from your perspective, from the public's perspective, from the legislature's perspective. So I, I hope you'll consider that. Um, the issue of the two-thirds vote for adopting uh, portions of the Code of Ethics, the Ethics Commission doesn't find this to be a significant infringement on its authority to adopt a Code of Ethics. Um, as was previously mentioned, it's currently a simple majority. Uh, a quorum of the Commission is five. So if five of the nine members of the Commission appeared at a meeting, three of them could vote to adopt a provision of the Code of Ethics, three of the nine. And that's a very small number to do something that is so significant as adopt a, an, an ethics law. And so the idea of, of, act, of implementing a, a higher number, a two-thirds number, we think is rational and reasonable. And, uh, and as uh, Mr. West mentioned, generally most provisions of the Code of Ethics are, are unanimous or near unanimous, and so we don't see that as being a significant infringement on the authority to adopt the Code of Ethics. Um, the complaint blackout, I'd, I've referred to it as a moratorium, but however you want to call it, blackout or moratorium. Uh, I, I don't know if it will surprise you to, to hear that the Ethics Commission isn't uh, adverse to the idea of talking about a moratorium during the campaign season. In fact, uh, in prior years, before this legislative session even, the Commission has discussed uh, the issue and question whether or not there should be some type of moratorium. They've never entered the rulemaking process to actually really flesh it out, which is what is necessary. Uh, so the, the statistics don't lie, though. There, we, the commission does note that there is a, a spike in complaints during the campaign season. Uh, we see some complaints are filed by political parties or political opponents of others. Sometimes they're good complaints, sometimes they're not. Uh, so the commission is willing to consider the, the issue of a moratorium, and, and I think that, that what you've heard is correct in that you know, I think we really have to question whether or not the Constitution is the right place for a moratorium, uh, as opposed to uh, allowing the Ethics Commission to go through their rulemaking process and hold workshops and hear testimony from you and look at what other states do and really make sure that we've got a moratorium that is sufficiently clear and written well and that is temporally limited to the right amount of time. Maybe it's 60 days, maybe it's 90 days, but let's explore it rather than just throw it into the Constitution where we can't amend it easily, where it might take another 10 or 12 or 15 or 30 years to, to amend it again. Um, I will say also that the, the way the moratorium is currently written, it's pretty vague. I, I, I know more than one person who has looked at it and doesn't know whether it's intended to prohibit people from filing complaints against candidates during the campaign season or whether it's meant to prohibit candidates from filing complaints during the campaign season. I think if you look at the language, you could read it either way. Uh, so we would, we would ask that you consider either letting us take a crack at it or you could take a crack at it through the legislative process. But uh, let's, 
hopefully considered not having that part of it in the Constitution. I promise you the Commission will take a really close look at it and is not hostile to the idea. Um, the, the other provisions, uh, I won't go into them in detail because I feel I've taken enough time, but I will say that, that uh, in looking through the other provisions, we don't find them to be uh, uh, against the, those three main planks that the, the public expects in this. And so, uh, you know, I, I will simply just finish by saying that uh, if this passes, if it goes on the ballot, something I noticed today, um, you know, it would be on the November 2016 ballot. That's exactly 30 years from the time it was initially put on the ballot in November of 1986. There's some kind of beautiful symmetry to that, I think, um, it, that, that it, 30 years later we're able to correct what the public initially uh, expected to have happen. And, uh, you know, in 1986, 144,000 people voted to create the Ethics Commission. And uh, this is expected to be a record turnout also, uh, perhaps, and so it'll be interesting to see how many people vote for it this year. I would expect it will be more than, than that. So I'm, I'm also here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Any questions for Jason? Yes, Representative Filippi. Mr. Gamet, thanks. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Is it your contention that we can statutorily limit the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission? Uh, I don't know that you could statutorily limit the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission, but a temporary moratorium that that is very time-limited that, that would simply uh, – say that for a certain period of time the commission won't hear complaints that other people file. Um, this is another reason why it would be better, I think, out of the Constitution. We might want to consider only having the moratorium apply to third-party complaints being filed, but you might still need – the commission, honestly, sh may, should still have the authority to initiate its own complaints at any time, especially because some of the complaints during campaign finance season – might be a complaint about a candidate who didn't file his financial disclosure statement. And, and I, I'd, I'd like to get to that, but it's, it's the contention that we should remove the moratorium from this resolution, and that moratorium could be imposed either statutorily or through the commission's rulemaking process. I would agree that you could impose a moratorium through your rulemaking process. I don't necessarily agree that once this is passed and put into the Constitution, that we would be able to statutorily impose a moratorium upon the commission. So it's, a, it's a close question. There is concurrent legislative authority between the assembly and the commission, and, and the, so the legislature has enacted certain provisions of the code that the commission has then ratified and adopted, like the main provisions of the conflict of interest provisions. So, so between the legislature and the ethics commission, I'm confident that a, a moratorium that uh, could be drafted that 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 would that may make sense. Uh, I'm not. I think it would be preferable for to, for the ethics commission to take a crack at, at at doing it through its rulemaking process, workshops, and public hearings. Um, and um, I'm not prepared today to say mm -hmm. exactly whether or not the what role. So certainly, and we're having a public hearing now, and, and, and I, I agree with you when you, you stated that we need to get this right. Yeah. We need to get it right now. My concern is that we put this important issue off to the future, and maybe the Ethics Commission and the legislature disagree about the legislature's ability to impose that moratorium at that time. And I think we are having public hearings now to, to vet out this issue. And so I would just, just want to state for the record that I, I, I'm concerned about – assertions that we would have the ability to limit your jurisdiction in the future. And anyhow, m moving on, this language speaks to the Ethics Commission shall not accept or initiate uh, a complaint during that blackout period. Does the does, does Ethics Commission act sua sponte ever, or is it always a complaint-driven process? Well, a complaint is always necessary to start the complaint process, but the Commission has the authority – to initiate its own complaints, to initiate its own investigations, to conduct preliminary investigations, pre-complaint, and to file complaints. And each year, in fact, the Ethics Commission does initiate financial disclosure complaints 
uh, against public officials who fail to file financial disclosure statements uh, during the appropriate period of time. And at times, the Commission also initiates substantive conflict of interest complaints when there is ample evidence of an of a alleged violation and a member of the public does not file a complaint, the Commission may and has initiated its own. So this blackout seeks to prevent not only complaints, but your investigatory complaints that are brought upon your, your own initiative. Am I correct? It, so, it appears that that's the intent. So it, would there be a way, I, I'm just trying to parse this, that this could be amended to prevent complaints during that blackout period by third parties, but not prevent complaints brought by the Ethics Commission during that blackout period. I'm sure period. that could be accomplished. Because if it was preventing third party complaints, we'd take the, the politics out of it, which seems to be the concern, but we would still allow the Ethics Commission to bring its own complaint for, for allegations that may be out there publicly known. Um, right. That, so that could be accomplished. The other, the other issue I will just mention about it being in the Constitution is by tying it to the filing of the Declaration of Candidacy, which is currently, I think, the last three consecutive Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of June. Is that, you would know better than I would. But, but um, so by tying it to that, remember that period is a statutory period. So if you're putting in the Constitution that the, the, the blackout period starts on that period, then what if that period gets statutorily changed to the first three days of April? Suddenly now it's an eight-month or nine-month blackout period. And so I would suggest if it's going to be in the Constitution, let's put a, a hard and fast period of time in there. Let's make it 60 days, 90 days, let's, rather than make it a generic uh, period. Understand. Okay, I, I'd like to move on. Um, in lines 11 through 12 on page 1, we speak to the assent of two-thirds of the members needed for adoption of every rule or regulation. Did you have any concerns that this would require your current rules and regulations to be affirmed or ratified by a two-thirds majority? Well, I don't think so. I mean, they were they regulations that have been passed in the past. I think this is my off-the-cuff opinion. I think they would be entitled to de facto uh, validity because at the time that they were enacted, they were enacted appropriately. Um, although at some point, even under the new Administrative Procedures Act that's being proposed this year, I think at some point all agencies may have to go back and reenact all of their regulations uh, again. So there may come a time when the Commission would have to reenact all of its rules and regulations. But I don't, I don't foresee having to do that by a two-thirds majority as being overly burdensome for the, for the Ethics Commission. Okay. And, and speaking to the code of ethics, I'm trying to, to wrap my head around exactly what legislators would be prevented from, from doing if, if this were to be passed. So we wouldn't be able to introduce legislation where there's a conflict of interest, I presume. We won't be able to vote on legislation where there's a conflict of interest. Speaking on, on issues where there may be a conflict of interest, is, is that currently prohibited by, by your code of ethics? Well, what the, what the code prohibits is using your public office to bring yourself a financial benefit or detriment, financial impact, let's just say for shorthand, or using it to financially impact your family, your business associates, or your employer. Um, so just simply speaking in general, walking down the hall and speaking, writing a letter to the editor, taking a call to a, for, with a constituent or sending an email is not really part of your public duty. It's not part of the legislative process or a core legislative act. But what would violate the code, I think, would be when you're engaging in what the term of art is a core legislative act, which would be a legislative act that you can only do because you are a legislator that involves the legislative process. So uh, introducing legislation, sponsoring legislation, voting on legislation, participating in a committee hearing regarding legislation as a committee member, as you know, maybe as opposed to just speaking at a public forum from a microphone like every other member of the public has. There is a public forum exception in the Code of Ethics that allows people to speak the same way that everyone else is allowed to speak. But speaking on the floor would, would be prohibited even if you weren't to take, you wouldn't take a vote. It, I think it would be, and the reason I think it would be is because I'm not allowed to go on the floor and speak. So speaking on the floor is something that only legislators can do as part of their public duty. So when you recuse from something, you recuse from all of it. 
It's kind of, we say the same thing to members of city councils or planning boards. If you're going to recuse from that, that uh, special use permit, it's not just recusing from the final vote. Don't participate in the hearing in any part of the discussion because, because you're using your public office to influence the way that the body is going to vote. So I, I think that's accurate. And, and, and lastly, I looked at page two uh, lines one and two, and it speaks to uh, any sanction issued by against any party by the Ethics Commission shall be appealable to the judicial branch as provided by law. Currently, if the Ethics Commission has an adverse ruling, is that appealed by writ of certiorari? Is it a, a statutory appellate process? It is. So my uh, take on that language is that it doesn't change anything. Uh, the, the Nothing will change, at least at the moment, that that, that that passes because there already is appeal as provided by law, which is currently through the Administrative Procedures Act, which is a well-established set of appellate principles that allows anyone aggrieved by a decision of the Ethics Commission to go straight to superior court and uh, seek a review. But that's not a de novo it's review. It's not a de novo. There, there, there's reliance on the factual conclusions made by the Ethics Commission. Yes, but there is – it could be de novo. Questions so, of law are reviewed de novo. Could, uh, could we statutorily – after we pass this, require a de novo review in superior court? I'm not certain. Uh, you, you definitely could make the appeal different than it currently is. It doesn't have to be through the Administrative Procedures Act. So it could be a different type of appeal process. I, 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 I would say that to the extent that it takes, it, it, it takes too much uh, deference away from the Ethics Commission, then it could start to conflict with some of the other constitutional grants of authority that the Ethics Commission has. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the Administrative Procedures Act. There could be other appellate review, as long as there is some form of appellate review. Uh, I would say currently, by the way, uh, the current system seems to work extremely well. Uh, you know, we, the Irons case was an example of someone taking an appeal from the Ethics Commission and appealing it to Superior Court and then moving up to the Supreme Court on a writ of certiorari. Uh, so it, it's an effective avenue for someone who's not happy with what happened before the Ethics Commission. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Chairman. Uh, Vice Chair Costa. Thank you, Chairman. Just for clarification, um, something that you said when you were talking to Blake, uh, excuse me, Representative Filippi, if we have a bill coming up and it's a fire, it, we're, we're voting on a fire district or we're voting on firefighters, which we do have a handful of firefighters on the House floor. Say if we're voting maybe pension reform again or something to do with the teachers, the firefighters would have to recuse themselves and not argue this on the House floor, and the same would uh, be intact for the teachers? No, Did I no, probably not. And... Uh, this is one of the things that I used to discuss in, in some of my prior year's testimony. So there is currently, and there will always be, a class exception written into the Code of Ethics. And every state that has a Code of Ethics, you have to have a class exception. The class exception says that even though maybe there's a financial impact, uh, to the extent that the impact is one that a significant class of people are all feeling, and you're in that class, but you're just one of a great number of people, everyone is impacted the same way, then you are allowed to participate. And the commission, you know, I could show you, and, and it used to be part of my testimony, I could show you advisory opinions that we've issued to legislators. We have probably a dozen or more to legislators who are teachers or firemen or police officers saying you can vote on pension reform issues even though you're impacted because you're just part of this really big class. We've got advisory opinions we've issued to lawyers saying you can vote on laws that impact domestic, uh, the pra domestic practice or family law even though you practice in family law because you're just one of, of many and it's, it's – uh, We've got uh, advisory opinions we've issued to legislator dentists that we've allowed them to participate in bills related to the general practice of dentistry and, and so on. Uh, so it'll, that's one of the things that's really going to benefit legislators and one of the things that's going to keep us really busy if this all passes is, you know, we'll be back to writing you advisory opinions so that if you have a question about a particular bill and uh, maybe you're even getting some uh, – pushback as to whether you can participate, you can go through our advisory opinion process and get an opinion in writing that says that it, that it does not violate the code of ethics for you to participate in this type of class exception behavior. 
Thank you so much. Rep. O'Grady, you want to hop in here? Let's... Okay. Representative McEntee, would you like your votes recorded? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was. My question was, since the, uh, the ethics rules apply to all elected and appointed officials and employees of the state and local government of boards, commissions, and agencies. So if, if during this blackout period, if someone were on, say, town council or planning board or zoning board, um, would that, would that, would they be exempt from any kind of ethics issue in their capacity as zoning on the zoning board or city council or town council, would they be exempt completely because they're running for office? I mean, for us in the legislature, we're not generally in session uh, on the end. Oh, I shouldn't say that. It could happen. But uh, at the end of June uh, through uh, November. But I, you know, obviously uh, town council, city councils, uh, you know, planning boards, zoning boards, employees of all different capacities are, you know, still functioning during a campaign. I think as written it would apply. So if you're on, if you're on a zoning board and you're running for a council in, in your town and someone claims that you had a conflict with the special use permit for uh, the construction of whatever that was, then the blackout period would apply and the commission would be prohibited from accepting that complaint. Seems like a broad brush uh, when you look at it that way. If you're continuing to do, uh, you know, your other duties, but well, this is one of the reasons why I feel that 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 opening it up to having public comment, where we we, we solicit, this is how we generally go through rulemaking at the Ethics Commission. We actually solicit comment from the cities and towns if things are going to impact cities and towns. We solicit um, comment from state elected officials, and it. it uh, the idea is to, to not be rash about something that has so much impact. Um, for putting things in the, in the Constitution is serious business, and it mm -hmm. requires serious consideration. So. Thank you. Yes, back to Representative Filippi. One more thing. The Ethics Commission has been around since 1986, am I correct? Right, and there was a predecessor state uh, the statutory agency before then even. Certainly. So in the past approximately 30 years, has there been an attempt by the Ethics Commission to impose a blackout? There has, they have never initiated rulemaking to explore it. It's beginning in about 2014, we can find a reference to the issue in the minutes of the Ethics Commission's meetings where the chairperson and the staff have discussed that maybe we should start to take a look at, at uh, the types of complaints that are filed during the election season and consider whether there's any type of policy that could be implemented to address it. Thank you. Any further questions for Jason? Representative Craven. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for coming. And with reference to uh, the blackout as it's being referred to, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that language, uh, but your point is well taken uh, in reference to the Ethics Commission itself not being able to initiate a complaint during that period of time. Um, let me ask you, what is the process of the Ethics Commission initiating its own complaint? Can you answer that for me? Sure. Well, there, there are a couple different ways it can happen. You know, first of all, we would only initiate our complaint if, if we were satisfied that, uh, you know, for us to initiate a complaint, we, we pretty much would, would only do so if, if we internally felt that there was probable cause probably to go forward at, at that point. We wouldn't just initiate an exploratory complaint. The process for a preliminary investigation, which we do have at the Commission, allows us to even pre-complaint in a confidential way to con start conducting a preliminary investigation to compile documents and talk to witnesses, and, and we notify and if we determine after that, and it's time limited, if we determine after that preliminary investigation that the evidence is sufficient to, to warrant the filing of a complaint, then we're allowed to file a complaint, which just starts the full investigation process, and, and suddenly all the due process uh, procedures will come into play in terms of... So there, it's safe to say that, uh, I'll just use a word that I'm comfortable with, uh, 
and you can let me know whether you're comfortable with it, that there's a vetting process, a screening, so to speak, process that the Ethics Commission goes through before it initiates an investigation, never mind a complaint. That's absolutely true. And, and you know, this is, this is what I'm about to say. I think you, you will n you understand that it's true, uh, and that is the only way the Ethics Commission has lasted for 30 years is by scrupulously maintaining an air of fairness and impartiality and nonpartisanship and independence. And if we stopped doing that, if suddenly we were filing complaints willy-nilly uh, at the drop of a hat, you know, you have some options. You know, the, there are checks and balances to, to what we do. Even though we're an independent agency, uh, there is still the appellate process. We still have to comply with due process. We still have to uh, comply with equal protection. You still have budgetary authority over uh, the Eth Ethics Commission. Um, you still have concurrent legislative authority over the Code of Ethics. So there are checks and balances all over, and, and you know, for 30 years we have a pretty good track record of, of um, deserving our reputation is being fair, and, and the Commission will always guard that with the filing of complaints. Would it be fair for me to assume that, since you just referenced uh, 2014 uh, minutes of the Ethics Commission's meetings where they discussed the possibility of moratoriums or some other process during the election cycle, would it be fair to say that those were not internally generated complaints, but rather complaints that were received externally uh, to the Ethics Commission? Absolutely. The Ethics Commission isn't filing complaints during campaign season against right. candidates. That's not... Uh, Why? Well, I mean, we're not trying to influence the... We're trying to stay completely nonpartisan. And, and it's funny, if you, if you look at the comments uh, in the, to the Projo, if you listen to talk radio, uh, you know, the, the people on the right are convinced that we're favoring the people on the left, and the people on the left are absolutely certain that we're favoring the people on the right with the way that we handle these complaints. So, um, it's, uh, it, so we're always taking steps to, to avoid anything that could even be the appearance of partisanship. Right. And... My last question, uh, would that not seem to make sense based on your own experience as legal counsel at the Ethics Commission, that if there were going to be a moratorium, it would exclude the Commission's generated complaints but include uh, exterior complaints from the public during a blackout period um, that may or may not be adopted in this legislation? That would make the most sense to me. If we were to file, say, financial disclosure complaints against candidates, it would be the same way we file them against, you know, incumbents, which is to say we would simp what we do is we take a category of people. Let's say all city council members across the state. If you, if you were running for city council and you didn't file a financial disclosure form, maybe you'll get a, you know, you, might, you may have a complaint filed against you, but it wouldn't be just the city council members in this town or that town or of one party or the other. Anything that the commission ever does when it's filing that type of financial disclosure complaint, it's always broad-based, a, a complete category to avoid any type of partisanship or favoritism. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Jason? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could we hear from, let's, let's call up three at a time. Could we ha hear from John Marion from Common Cause, Rhode Island? Jane Kostler from the League of Women Voters, and Margaret Kane from Operation Clean Government. John, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, uh, I wanted, I'll, I'm going to try uh, at the end of my testimony to address some of the questions uh, that have been raised um, because I think we have uh, some answers to um, but I want to thank you. I want to thank um, the sponsors. I'm going to talk briefly about both bills. I want to thank Speaker Mattiello and his staff for working on the resolution uh, for many, many hours. Um, we didn't start the journey together, I'll just say, but I think we're going to finish it uh, awfully close. 
I want to thank Representative Marcello, who uh, had to leave uh, for sponsoring his resolution for, for six years uh, and sticking with it. Um, we've long supported uh, the language that is in Representative Marcello's resolution, uh, H7577. Uh, we, uh, Common Cause, originally authored that text in 2009 uh, after the Rhode Island Supreme Court case in Irons versus the Rhode Island Ethics Commission. Uh, as you heard Phil West say, um, the majority opinion in that case uh, said that uh, even though the uh, ethics amendment in Article 3, Section 8 had to yield to the speech and debate clause, uh, that this could be changed by a sufficiently explicit constitutional amendment. And we've taken that as our standard ever since. Uh, and that is what uh, we believe is represented in H7577. Uh, um, since last week when the speaker came out with his proposal in 8189, We've examined it to make sure that it meets this sufficiently explicit uh, criteria. Um, as has been pointed out, it does not contain all the language uh, in Representative Marcello's uh, resolution. Uh, and we think uh, that it would certainly benefit um, from that additional language. And as uh, several witnesses have already said, um, uh, we would ask that the committee choose to put that back in, particularly that key phrase and adjudicate. Uh, we shared that in a letter uh, to the speaker um, late last week, our, our belief about that. After uh, determining that it met our criteria uh, in terms of being sufficiently explicit, we set out to look at the rest of uh, the speaker's resolution, uh, 8189. Um, first, we looked at uh, the change uh, from a simple majority to a two-thirds vote. Um, Common Cause supports this change um, for the rulemaking power um, because we think uh, that it's not a bad thing to have it occur um, with uh, greater consensus. There are many supermajority votes uh, in law and in, in rules elsewhere. So um, your uh, rules contain supermajority votes. Uh, the Rhode Island general laws contain supermajority votes, as we'll find out on budget night. There's a requirement for a supermajority vote for the budget as a whole. And in fact, Robert, Robert's rules of order um, say that supermajority votes of two-thirds, what we see here, uh, should be used any time there are changes that affect minority rights. So we support that. Another uh, significant change that has been much discussed tonight is this moratorium on complaints. Um, as this, the speaker actually read our, read our testimony that we put out in advance, um, Vimala on our staff uh, uh, went through all the minutes for the last 10 years of the Ethics Commission. Uh, and every month they report the number of complaints they have and then uh, put that into an Excel spreadsheet and then we handed it off uh, to, he j just had a lead, Professor Myers, uh, who's a political scientist at Providence College and is on our board. And he uh, did a very simple uh, statistical analysis. Uh, he looked uh, at the uh, number of complaints reported at the October and November meetings. Do you have any former elected officials on your board? Yes, we have two former members of the Cranston City Council. Yes. Um, and and uh, the, the results of the test were that um, when you compare uh, the two months uh, in an election year, um, as the speaker said, you have an average of 18 complaints per month. When you compare the other 22 months in the election cycle, you have an average of 9.7 complaints. And that passes um, a simple t-test for statistical significance, which means uh, that we can have 95 percent or greater certainty that that did not occur by chance. Um, so, so that meets the basic test. So we know that there is a, a spike in complaints in the two months prior to the election. Um, however, as other witnesses have said, Common Cause feels strongly that this moratorium uh, should not be in the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution is a document for laying out our basic principles, not managing the day-to-day -day policies of a commission. Um, to emphasize that point, um, we submitted a letter today to the commission uh, that is included in the written testimony I shared with you, um, asking the commission to consider adopting uh, a regulation uh, that would impose uh, a moratorium. As I point out in that letter, the commission has precedent for imposing limits on its power. 
uh, just in 2013, I think in June of 2013, it imposed a statute of limitations after some um, deliberation among commissioners about a statute of limitations. There is no statute of limitations in the general laws for um, complaints to the Ethics Commission, but the Ethics Commission said six years seems like a sufficient uh, statute of limitations, and they imposed that. In the same way, we think they could impose a moratorium on complaints. It's worth mentioning, um, because I don't think it has been emphasized enough, this doesn't mean that uh, a complaint won't be received. It just means the complaint would be received after the election is passed. So if it's a valid complaint, by all means, it gets submitted the day after the election, and it goes through the regular Ethics Commission process. Um, so uh, our, our suggestions for the moratorium are, one, uh, it should be shorter in length, uh, as the uh, uh, review of the complaints um, that the speaker cited uh, indicates, there's a spike about 60 days before. Uh, there's, if you add September to that analysis, it's not statistically significant. So we're not seeing um, the uh, spike occurring early in the election cycle. It's at the end. Uh, we also believe um, that, the, uh, as Representative Craven talked about, the Ethics Commission's right to initiate complaints independent of a public complaint um, should be preserved, particularly because the legislature passed a statute years ago requiring that all candidates submit financial disclosure uh, forms, and it would be difficult for them to enforce that without the ability to file a complaint for those who don't comply. Um, and finally, I'll just comment on um, this question of the judicial appeal. Um, this proposal clarifies that anyone found in violation of the code is afforded an appeal before the Superior Court. We believe this added sentence, which really preserves the status quo, uh, is good because we believe the status quo uh, has served us well for the last 29 years. So again, I'll thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I will um, be happy to answer any questions. I guess the one other point I'd like to make on Representative Filippi's point um, uh, about would this require them to, to adopt uh, all their regulations again? I think that's a very good question. Uh, as Jason alluded to, there's actually a bill from the administration uh, in front of the committee. I think it might even be have on tomorrow night, um, but uh, from the Office of Regulatory Reform where they're attempting to sort of streamline regulations, and that bill in its current form will require all administrative agencies that have promulgated rules under the APA in a matter of years to readopt all of their um, uh, regulations. So, so this may be happening regardless um, uh, of, of this effort. It may be happening because the APA is about to change um, uh, that process too. So happy to answer any questions. Any questions for John? Representative O'Grady. Just one. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, thank you for your testimony, and, and thanks also for um, uh, clarifying for us where those statistics came about the the spike in um, uh, in complaints. I'm I'm curious if um, uh, maybe you don't know the answer to this, but assuming that many of those complaints or the you know the marginal increase in those complaints were spurious or, or based on some uh, you know attempt to game the electoral process, um, wouldn't you assume that if you impose just a two-month moratorium or blackout or whatever we're calling it, that that would simply cause the gamemanship to go uh, to take place a little earlier in the cycle? Is that a reasonable assumption? It, it, um, perhaps, but I think we all know that much like, you know, um, you, you know, the intensity of campaigns picks up at the end, and the, the folks who are doing opposition research or sending out releases to try to get attention – picks up as the campaign goes on. Uh, and I think as, in as much as these are used as sort of political tools, they're used at the end, maybe even as a desperate measure um, from a losing candidate uh, to, to gain some attention that they're not receiving otherwise because of other failures of their campaign or whatnot. Um, yeah, I think you, you may shift it uh, a little bit, but I would expect it, that wouldn't account for the whole the whole lot of them. I don't think you're going to see, on average, 
a, a spike of almost, as the speaker said, 100 percent suddenly in August because a moratorium is about to go into effect in September. Representative Vigello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I hear that, and it makes sense that maybe there wouldn't be so many. But if the Ethics Commission is taking up to 180 days, which is six months, to reach a decision, and they can extend that, um, they are accepting then a complaint and looking at it, and it's hanging over that candidate's head until past the election, quite likely. So if, if there's not a way to to assure that if a, if a complaint is, is accepted to be heard, it will be dispatched before an election, it seems to me that the, it seems to me, I guess, that the um, time limit or the blackout should fit with the commission's capacity to deal with a complaint and see it through. Yeah, so if I understand your question, you know, thinking through it, if a complaint's received before the blackout period, it doesn't mean that they can't continue to process the complaint. So the person could be quote unquote, and exonerated during the blackout period. So that's one part of the, um, my answer. The other is, the thing to know about our ethics process is it's the most transparent there is, right? So in many jurisdictions, complaints are received, and when they're received, they're kept as a secret. They're kept as a secret often until the probable cause stage. And Common Cause, decades ago, and back in, in the West tenure, fought that because we didn't think it was in the public interest to keep these things secret. Uh, and ultimately, um, we won that, and, and for three decades, they haven't been, almost three decades, haven't been secret. Um, the, the flip side of making them all transparent is it adds some sort of validity to complaints that have been received. And so there is another way to deal with this, which is you don't impose a blackout or a moratorium, but you keep things secret. And people really don't like their government keeping things secret from them. So I would submit that a moratorium that simply says we're not going to take them for this short period, but it may be valid, come back November 9th, and we'll be happy to deal with you, um, is much better than a government saying, I can't confirm or deny that I've received a complaint from a member of the public uh, and I won't be able to confirm or deny that for some indeterminate period until we may may not get to adjudicating that complaint that I can't concede, you know, um, say that we've received. And, and I've seen that dance in other states, and it's not a very pretty dance. And the public does not like to hear from their government that the government may or may not have a document um, that a press release may say, they've gotten. It just doesn't help. Representative Filippi. Thank you. I'd like to speak a little bit about third-party initiated complaints and complaints initiated by the Ethics Commission themselves. Currently, all elected officials have submitted ethics disclosures for our 2015 activity. Uh, after the decoration period, challengers who aren't currently in elected office, they're going to be sent an ethics disclosure once they become a candidate. And they're required under current law to submit that. And if they don't, the Ethics Commission institutes an action against them. Under this moratorium, how would the Ethics Commission or the state address someone who fails, a challenger who fails, to submit the required Ethics uh, Commission disclosure for 2015 activity? As currently written in the proposed resolution, I don't think there there is any way for the commission to deal with that. So... All of us have submitted ours. Any challengers, if this passes, and this would be 2018 because obviously it wouldn't apply to this year, challengers at that point wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be prosecuted by the Ethics Commission because they've declared and now we're in a blackout period. Yeah, all you could do is resort to sort of the power of the press and shaming them into saying you didn't submit it and the commission could confirm that they didn't submit it because 
when the press requests it, the commission could say we don't have one. But if we limited the um, but, blackout. But yes, I, I think I agree with your point, which is that both the incumbent and the challenger should have to play by the same set of rules. But if we limited the blackout period to just third party complaints, this wouldn't be an issue. I, I don't, I think that would alleviate that problem, yes. Thank you. Any other questions for Jason? Yes, Representative Coughlin. When you say not take a complaint, are you saying you don't file it officially or you send it back to, or the ethics commission would send it back to the complainant and tell them to resubmit at the end so, of the period? Yeah, I obviously don't speak for the commission, but the language I've seen in other jurisdictions, and there are several other jurisdictions that have blackout windows, um, some just for ethics complaints, some for other types of complaints, such as even campaign finance complaints. Um, which I find curious to have a blackout window before an election. Um, the, the, the language suggests they get sent back, right? So you send a letter to a commission um, and they send it back and say, they cite the law that prohibits them from taking the complaints. Uh, and I don't know whether or not they say s resubmit it after the election or not, but the law makes it evident that you can resubmit it after the election, the blackout window is over. So my guess would be that the Ethics Commission would adopt some sort of policy of having a form letter that they send you saying, here's why we can't take your complaint right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions for Jason? Or John. John. It's okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Keeble, for this opportunity today to testify in front of our Rhode Island House Judiciary Committee. My name is Jane Coster, and I represent the League of Women Voters of Rhode Island as president of the League. The League has had many opportunities to be present at the State House in these past many decades in support or opposition for legislation and resolutions as we advocate for good government and open participation by our voters. Today is also unique in that for a decade, the League has without pause supported restoring the full jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission over the members of the General Assembly. The League thanks you, Chairman Keeble, and this committee and the sponsors of this House Resolution 8189 for bringing it forward. The resolution would submit a constitutional amendment to the voters of Rhode Island in the November election to restore jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission over the General Assembly. As I meet with League leaders and members and friends of the League throughout our state, this is truly what I have heard the voters of Rhode Island asking to see on the ballot this November. I believe they are demanding it today. The League, as others bringing testimony today have done or will do, urges you to consider including the words and adjudicate to the sentence so that the full sentence reads, the Ethics Commission shall have the authority to investigate and adjudicate violations of the Code of Ethics, including acts otherwise protected by Article 6, Section 5, and to impose penalties as provided by the law. The League of Women Voters also asks that a moratorium on complaints be put in statute or preferably Ethics Commission regulation and not within the constitutional amendment for all of the details that we have heard thus far today. And uh, since all the details have been given, I just um, support this resolution. I would also like to thank um, Sen Senator um, Marcello for all the work that he has done in the past five years in support of an ethics commission and this, this type of a resolution. So I thank you again and all those who are working so hard to craft this resolution and to restore the public's confidence in our Rhode Island government. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Any questions for Jane? Thank you. Margaret? Thank you. Uh, the button, the button. Uh, 
I should know that. Well, I usually can be heard over, so it doesn't really matter. But thank you, uh, Chairman Keebler and members of the committee, for uh, hearing me and all of us who are interested in increasing the the uh, the purview of the Ethics Commission over uh, the General Assembly. Uh, I have written testimony. You've heard a lot of this stuff, so I'm, I'm not going to go into that. You know about the uh, and adjudicate we would like to see. We think the moratorium is overbroad and shouldn't be in, in, in uh, the Constitution but in statute. But I would like to say something. Um, well, first of all, um, thanks to uh, Representative Marcello, who has labored alone or reasonably alone in the vineyards on this for some six years, and we are delighted to hear that the speaker has taken this seriously, seriously enough to sponsor a bill, and we hope that this is, will be taken very seriously by the committee. Um, the, the thing that has not been talked about a great deal, and that is about perception, and that is the perception that Rhode Island is a, um, well, less than an honorable state, perhaps, uh, and certainly what, is, what has been tested in, in areas and been studied is what the economic uh, detriment of that is to the state. We need to have a good ethical base to have people more interested in joining uh, part of Rhode Island's economy. Uh, and I think that, that there, there are studies which we can provide, uh, but that's a very important issue here. It's not just uh, that perception of saying you guys are all uh, crumb balls as, uh, as uh, Phil West has fought uh, over and over. Um, again, perception is a very important thing. And I will only finish by saying that a friend, when I told them that I was coming up to the State House uh, to talk about an ethics bill, their comment was, oh, you're not going to start building that permanent FBI office in the State House. And that's an unfortunate, a very unfortunate kind of joke um, that I think this will go a great deal toward uh, preventing in future. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Margaret? Thank you. Could we hear from Bill Soretti, Pat Santori, and Bill Falkner? You can begin whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. First of all, thank you for doing something, and then thank you for having the hearings on. Could you just identify yourself, please? Okay, thank you for doing something, and thank you for holding hearings on it. Um, the people have been asking for ethics reform for quite some time. The scandals coming out of the State House, the General Assembly, and the leadership is the stuff of legends. Hollywood, wouldn't, Hollywood would reject a movie plot like this simply because moviegoers wouldn't believe that this could actually happen. There's currently two bills being introduced concerning ethics reform. But knowing how things are usually done, many people have a fear that these bills, if voted on, will be riddled with carve-outs and caveats. And it looks like, just listening with what I heard just now, your um, blackout is going to be perceived as a carve-out for a very select group of people, and that would be incumbents, because people running against those incumbents probably wouldn't have anything that would, would warrant an ethics complaint anyways. So good luck selling that one to the people. I had a bunch of stuff I was going to write, I was going to read, but I saw a cop out there with a gun on his hip, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Um, and then, then, then the, uh, the speaker talked about a spike in the ethics complaints the two months before the, the month of the election and the month before the election. Well, is it possible that those were campaign contribution ethical violations, and maybe that's why they spiked at that time? Um, did anybody look into what those uh, complaints were and what was the outcome of those complaints? Um, Is, 
if the ethics bill is just another dog and pony show, like we've seen so often, it's just not going to fly. The, the bill, it looks like it's a good one, and obviously you get a lot of very learned and educated people here saying that it is, and I'll follow them. But that uh, carve out sure looks, it, that looks, you know, like I said, good luck selling that to the people. And that's okay, could you just identify yourself for the record? Excuse me? If you could just state your name for the record. Oh, Bill Surratt. Thank you, Mr. Surratt. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bill Felkner. I am the project coordinator for Clean Rhode Island, um, the Coalition for Legislative Ethics and Accountability now in Rhode Island. Um, we are a, a membership of about, well, specifically 21 groups as of yesterday. Uh, we made a conscientious effort to make a very diverse group. We have representatives, uh, advocates on the left, such as Progressive Democrats and Rhode Island Future, and uh, members on the right, Rhode Islands for Immigration Law Enforcement and Tea Party, several groups in between. Um, there are groups such as the Unitarian Ministries and the Alliance for Safe Communities that represent community uh, sectors, and of course, uh, such as the Builders and Associates, um, the Rhode Island Builders and Associates, that are an example of the business communities that support our work. Um, again, we try to make a very diverse politically and community uh, organization to express how important this issue is. Um, and also uh, to uh, Speaker Mattiello's point, it's an economic issue as well. So we also uh, got a few uh, notable individuals that would endorse our statements. Um, Alan Hassenfeld, John Hazenwhite, Gary Sass, um, Ken Block and, of course, Phil West uh, had already identified himself as part of the coalition. So there's many people here that will speak for themselves. My job was to find a consensus among those groups. Um, quite frankly, they don't all love the bill. Um, there's always going to be something that is not agreeable to everybody. But I wanted to come today to share four key points that they've all been in agreement uh, besides the fact that we think it's a wonderful thing that we've gotten this far. Firstly, and you've heard it, and many of these will be repeated because I think um, some of the coalition members have already expressed it, but the first point is that this moratorium language should not, must not be in the Constitution. Um, as it's been explained by people smarter than I that it could be done legislatively or through the Ethics Commission, um, but quite frankly, the, the Constitution scares a lot of people because if there are issues with it, we want to be able to address it in the future. Secondly, uh, and again, this has been mentioned, but if there is to be a moratorium, make it identified by the number of days rather than a legislative-defined day that can be changed in the future to the Ethics Commission's point. And we would also ask that it be shorter. To Speaker Mattiello's point, he expressed that the spike is in the last two months, as Representative you had, had commented on. And so we just feel that a much shorter window would be appropriate as well. Thirdly, um, regardless of the length or uh, uh, even if there is a, a, well, obviously if there's a moratorium, the Ethics Commission, again, as explained by the Ethics Commission, uh, Jason at the Ethics Commission, the Ethics Commission itself must be allowed to initiate an investigation. Um, we have put them in place, given them a tremendous amount of a power and, and trust, and we have to expect or respect that they have the ability to do that uh, responsibly. And lastly, um, the and adjudicate. Um, I, I can't get into uh, the legal side of it as well as uh, John Marion or, or Mr. West, um, but I can say that Common Cause had seven lawyers look at it, and if seven lawyers agree on two words, that's an amazing feat, and we think that that's going to get it done. So, um, again, I've got to deal with 21 groups. They all have boards of directors. Getting consensus is not easy, but we have those. And, and the last thing I wanted to say after sharing that is just to say thank you. It has been seven years. Uh, many, many people have fought very long and hard. This is a pretty good bill. If we can make those four changes, it gets to be a, a much better bill. Uh, I'm here to tell you we'll never find a perfect bill because I've got people on both sides of several issues. But to make those changes would be monumental. And to Margaret's point, it would 
do an amazing thing for the credibility of, of this uh, body. Thank you. Representative Jello. Thank you, Chairman Keeble. Uh, can you tell us the mission of your organization? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Bill Falkner. You're talking to me? The mission of your organization. Though. Yes. The mission of the organization is to educate the public and legislature on who supports this ethics reform legislation and why. So it's how, how long have you been in existence? We just started it to make this push last year. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And you're welcome. Thank you. Any further questions for Bill? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Is uh, Pat Centauri not here? Okay. Uh, could I hear from could we, the committee here from Liz Tabor, Randall Rose, and Nick Gorham? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. I've um, testified several times in the past as a private um, citizen. My name is Liz Tabor. I'm from Newport. I'm the president of Citizens Concerned About Casino Gambling. Um, and I was really pretty hurt driving up listening to a talk radio station that shall not be named, um, hearing a recent discussion about a legislative Slater, who has decided not to pursue running for office, the phone calls were what were so disturbing. Call after call said she must have been threatened. She must have been bribed. She must have something nefarious. It's so upsetting to think someone who was leading the oversight committee, who was trying to work with the group to, to give credibility for, to point out a few who may not have been as honorable as all of you, would automatically there be a perception by the citizens of this state that there's something criminal going on. It's time we change that perception. There's incredibly good work being done here. You should be recognized for it and we should be confident in the work that you're doing. The citizens, not the legislature, created the Ethics Commission by Constitutional Convention in 1986. We thought this language was abundantly clear but legal language is not intuitive, and even Supreme Court justices disagreed about its interpretation. Uh, but let me remind you, the voters did not seek consensus of the legislature first. Uh, we have learned a painful and damaging lesson over these past seven years. The Irons decision is a shining example how much language does matter. And Irons himself... Um, from reading Phil West's book was one of my white hats and by the end of the book became a black hat. To be in an environment where you're trying to do good but the pressures and the power around you can pull you in is not something any of you should be subjected to ever. Um, also among the new changes in 8189, the Ethics Committee can no longer expel any member of the legislature. I haven't heard that mentioned. One of the reasons is it's never been abused. It's never been used in 29 years. We don't stand against it. The uh, clean uh, government groups that stand with Mr. Felkner and his efforts, um, and again, with the uh, increase of the two-thirds vote for a rule change, there are more controls on the ethics committee moving forward, but they must be free to do their job. Speaker Mattiello just testified, and he used the words investigate and prosecute. Using that word prosecute, it seems clear to me that adjudicate was his intent. I ask all of you in an amendment to please say what we mean and mean what we say. I support the language change, uh, changes being suggested by, by Common Cause and all of the coalition group members. Um, the moratorium language is an, is an effort at reform, and it, because it might be tested and changed, it does not belong in the, cons in the Constitution itself, which should be more based on timeless principles that guide our state. Um, 60 days seems rather sufficient, but please let the Ethics Commission continue to investigate and pr uh, proceed with any charges that come up during that time. 
Thank you very much for listening and for your efforts to move this forward. It's incredibly important, and every citizen is talking about it, whether you know they are or not. We can't call our reps every single day. We can't read every paper cover to cover. There's too many to keep up with. So I ask all of you to believe that we're upset, and we really thank you for helping to fix this. Thank you. Any questions for Liz? Thank you very much. Randall? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm um, really glad to be here today. Um, we're, we're making so much progress on the Ethics Commission, um, and there's a lot of people to thank on this, but um, I want to say that um, this would not have happened without thousands of Rhode Islanders pushing for this, um, and um, so many Rhode Islanders treat this issue as important and have cared about it and have helped make this go forward. Um, so this is something that everybody deserves credit for, but of course there are individuals who deserve credit. Um, Speaker Mattiello, um, John Marion has done, um, in a different level, has done a lot um, in, in the last couple of weeks and also for many years um, on the Ethics Commission, and other people have um, explained how much they've done earlier today. So I'm here to testify on both bills. I'm supp in support of both bills, um, the, um, 7577, I've supported in the past. Um, and I'm also supporting um, the, um, H8189, the new bill. Um, and I understand that um, 8189 is still subject to revision. Um, and that's something that a lot of people have talked about in their testimony today um, and have suggested revisions for it. I think that's a healthy process. Um, I also want to say I welcome Speaker Mattiello's comments. Speaker Mattiello said um, when he was discussing the moratorium, he, he, he spoke about it, this whole issue in deferential terms, and he said that the, the or I don't know if deferential is the right word, but he spoke about it um, in, in a good way and said um, for a moratorium, he just said he didn't know any um, better way of dealing with these problems than to have a moratorium. And I appreciate the implicit openness in that, and, um, and, uh, it seemed, and it's good that we're going through this process of discussion. And that's what this hearing is for. Um, so, um, the, um, we've all heard that there's a number of suggested changes people have made about how to better accomplish the goals of this legislation. Um, and I'm, um, there seem to be some areas where the good government people have a consensus. Um, may not be what the current text of 8189 says, but um, I understand it's subject to negotiation and we are getting there. Um, and so that's a good thing. I want to, um, I do support the suggested changes that people have made, um, such as removing the right to, um, such as restoring the Ethics Commission's right to um, expel, to remove people from office who have committed serious wrongdoing. I, I think that should be um, restored, and, and, some, and I support the other changes people made. I want to speak particularly about the issue of the moratorium, because um, the moratorium is a key issue. Um, I, the one thing I've heard people insisting on most is the moratorium should not be in the Constitution, and people have other changes suggesting it. But let me just say about the moratorium. The moratorium is something that cuts both ways. Um, on the one hand, we do have um, some politically motivated complaints that are being made. Um, when I heard about those statistics that m there were more complaints in the two months at, before the election, I was thinking, hmm, is that because people do um, more unethical acts during the election? But no, that's not really it. That's just a joke. Um, but the, um, but the, um, the uh, moratorium, it, um, it, the moratorium um, might slightly um, discourage people from, um, from submitting complaints just to make a political point. It doesn't have much effect in that respect because um, somebody can, a candidate can just say, I'm going to submit an ethics complaint when it's legal for me to do so, and they can say that during the election. They can still publicize their complaints. So it doesn't work for, um, all that well in that respect. But the other thing about the moratorium is it cuts both ways. It doesn't just apply to the unjust justified politically motivated complaints, it applies to the good ones. It doesn't just apply to the third party complaints, it applies to the complaints that the Ethics Commission is putting forward. And what it does is it denies voters the right to know. It denies voters the right to know that this, um, this complaint is being submitted. Um, and I and so we have a trade-off. I mean, should we try to have this blackout and um, not let um, these, not let the committee take the complaints so as to deprive politically motivated complaints of um, some publicity? Or should we respect voters' right to know um, and just um, let it all happen transparently, which is the way the Ethics Commission has traditionally worked? Um, I personally feel um, that voters' right to know should be more important, and just one way to see that is 
what, what does the media do? When the media receives complaints about a, a candidate, um, that's, um, they don't impose a blackout on reporting complaints in the media just because it's close to an election, and we wouldn't want them to do that. Um, the media feels, and rightly, that um, when there's allegations about a candidate, that um, the voters' rights know trumps the risk that some of those allegations might be politically motivated. So that's my point of view on this. But I would personally defer to the Ethics Commission. I think the Ethics Commission is the body that's best placed to decide whether there should be a moratorium or not. Um, and the reason for that is what we heard um, but, um, before in testimony, that the legislature has a conflict of interest. Um, the um, on issues where the legislature has a conflict of interest and the Ethics Commission has the authority to decide, it's better to let the Ethics Commission decide that. Um, and so it, um, the um, the Ethics Commission doesn't have a stake one way or another, particularly in whether these complaints are received um, before the election, um, but the, um, for um, legislators it may affect whether they keep their job, so I think it's better for the Ethics Commission to make that decision. Um, so it's um, and it's particularly important to have to respect voters' right to know during election period because that's the one time when voters have something like an ability to hold um, people accountable if they do something wrong. Um, so that's that's my point, point of view on this. But I'm glad this process is this is being negotiated. I think we've already made a lot of progress, um, and we can work on this um, still. And after that, hopefully, it's going to this will be passed the um, legislature and go to the voters. Um, I hope this bill won't be made worse. Um, there's um, if it gets, gets worse, that will be a serious problem. Um, and I thought, and I hope that the changes that people have recommended will be adopted. But ultimately, it will be in the hands of the voters. Um, and if voters do decide to vote this down, um, that's that will be because the voters feel that, it didn't, that this did not go far enough in respecting ethics. So that's another reason why um, it's important to make the changes that people have been recommending, um, because that increases the chances that voters will support it. If voters do vote it down, then they will, voters will keep on pressing um, for this change to be made until it's made in the way that they like. So I hope that the so I hope this bill passes. I think it's on, um, has taken some good steps, and I hope it continues to be improved. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Randall? Thank you. Former Representative Gorham, welcome back. Once again, my mic was shut off. How do you like that? Um, this time of my own volition. That's what's different today. <laughs> um, anyway, the, um, I sat on judiciary for quite a few years and um, sat in your place, and I know you've been here for a long time tonight, and I just want you to know I appreciate it. Um, the... Uh, the thing I like most about being in the House when I was here is what I call the, the full circle uh, concept. You would be very conservative, or you'd think you were, and uh, you'd be on an issue, and then you'd, you'd be way over to the right in my case, and you'd be looking to your right, and you'd see someone from the left standing right beside you on the same issue, someone like uh, Edia Jello. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, speaking for you. But it happens. happens all the time. One of those issues, you know what it was? It was the, in this committee, every year they'd bring forth a bill that said that you've, if you filed a frivolous complaint, you could be prosecuted. You could be fined for filing a frivolous complaint against a legislator. And, and to my knowledge, um, that bill almost always failed because we united. This remedy, this blackout period, that's what I really want to talk about today. You're, you're, you're now making it much worse than that chilling. Remember the ACLU would come and talk about that, that bill where you could be fined for filing a frivolous ethics complaint? Remember what they said, Representative Agello? It would have a chilling effect on the exercise of people's rights of free speech. What are we doing? We're, dra we're dropping an atom bomb now on the right of free speech. That's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're destroying rights that are already in the Rhode Island Constitution and the United States Constitution 
in the name of what looks like from the outside, and I've been on the outside for eight years now, like an act of pure self-preservation. That's what it looks like. The blackout period looks like pure self-preservation, that you are trying to protect yourselves from ethics complaints. But we know it's much worse than that. It's not just you. You're going to protect everybody from ethics complaints if you if this goes on the ballot the way it, it's written, every office holder. You can't file an ethics complaint against any office holder during the blackout period. It's universal. Town council, state senator, state representative, anybody. Anybody who would otherwise be subject to an ethics complaint suddenly during the blackout period, they don't have to worry. That's really, really a bad idea. I just can't stress it enough. And for those who champion the chilling effect of, of those bills that failed that said we could prosecute and fine people for filing ethics complaints, you're now putting them in a deep freeze. That's what you're doing. We just can't do this. This is a very, very bad idea. And here's the other problem with it. You're doing something really good putting this on the ballot. That's a great thing. And I, I remember in 2000, uh, 2003, uh, Representative Vigello, I think you and I helped put separation of powers on the ballot. I sponsored the bill. We, find, we got a good bill. We didn't yield. We listened to what the people had said. And we put it on the ballot for 2004, and it passed by more than 70%. Look what you're doing with this bill. How many times did you hear during the debate to put legislators within the scope of the Ethics Commission how many times did you hear during the debate that we needed a blackout period? None. It was never even mentioned. This is a self-insertion by someone to, again, it looks like an act of self-preservation. So this is really a bad idea, uh, the blackout period. Otherwise, the bill's fine. It's a little ambivalent. Uh, I agree with, um, I heard some of the comments earlier tonight. Uh, you know, it looks, it looks uh, line 17 and 18, I think, need some work, but I don't want to get deep in the weeds on that. I, I know you'll get that figured out. It looks like a candidate can't file a complaint, though, read one way, or read another way, that you can't file a complaint against a candidate. Now, I know you meant the latter, not the former, but I think you need to work on that language because it could be either, depending on who reads it. And I know someone said that earlier. I just want to point out that I agree with them. Um, the other thing is, I just want to relate a personal experience. I served up here for 10 years. I took a lot of tough positions. I debated on the floor. I think I hold the all-time record for the number of amendments in one year. Uh, I accounted for a quarter of all the amendments in 2006 that came to the floor of the House. And I had tough elections every year but one. I felt like I always had a target on my back. I never, ever had to defend an ethics complaint at any time. And I don't know about you, I mean, I, it's not my place to ask you, but really, I mean, how many of you have had ethics complaints filed against you? What's the big deal here? And let's say one is filed. We know that you win campaigns by how hard you work and how hard you go door to door. The one year I lost, I didn't work hard. And, you know, I, I don't think that ethics complaints make or break campaigns, and I think that everybody in the General Assembly knows it. That's not how you win, and it's not how you lose. So um, I've probably already talked for too long, um, but I really hope you'll, uh, and I mean all of this respectfully. I, I think, I know you guys work hard, and this was one of my favorite committees ever to be on. Um, I used to hear the same arguments every year, and I know you have too, but I never got sick of them. I never got sick of them. Um, Really think about this. Uh, you know, there's going to be a floor amendment. Let's face it. <laughs> I'm certainly familiar with floor amendments. Someone is going to try to amend this on the floor. And I hope, um, hope some of you will um, just take one word that's been mentioned tonight about the blackout period and try to remember that during the, um, during the floor debate on the amendment, which is inevitably coming. So um, thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Representative Vigello. It's good to see you again, Nick. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I do see you when I'm out walk walking my dog and you're out walking your yes, dog now yeah. that you have a home in Providence. Yes. As well sorry. as Foster. Right. Uh, I don't have a home in Foster. Coventry. Coventry. Sorry. Uh, 
I'm not altogether sure that the blackout period regarding an ethics, ethics complaint against a candidate is going to have the effect that some might hope it does. Yeah, I agree. If I have an opponent who is is wanting to make allegations about my behavior and my conflict of interest or other ethical improprieties, the campaign can't be re- or the complaint can't be received by the ethics commission, but that opponent can is free to talk to my neighbors and talk to our neighbors, walk the district, print flyers, uh, talk to the media right. about the allegations. They're still out there. So I'm not sure that the blackout effect is going to work right. Um, right. to right. Right. protect me or anyone else. Um, well, think about that. But this. I do think that... Having the blackout has the benefit for candidates of not having the public be looking to the Ethics Commission, all right, what are they going to say? What are they going to say? What are they going to say? It's just, it's time out. We'll see about that later. So it's my word against hers, whether I'm unethical, whether I am doing something bad, which in the end it really is anyhow. Well, what about a complaint that's filed um, before the filing period? This amendment says it's, it's stuck in the freezer. It's chilled until the election. That's the way I read it. The Ethics Commission, it says, um, it, I know it's, I, I wrote it down earlier today when I was thinking about this. Uh, the Ethics Commission um, can't do anything. Yeah, it cannot proceed on a complaint, period. Ethics Commission can't. So even for complaints filed before the filing deadline, one way to read this is that the Ethics Commission cannot proceed with a complaint. So you're right, there's going to be a blackout period. I would suggest to you that the penumbral effect of the blackout period is going to make it much worse than the the four months that it's been trivialized as. Um, and that's a real danger, the penumbral effect. Um, I just, I don't think, you know, when you go after a candidate, I never ran a negative brochure ever in the 10 years that I was in the House and I, I ran for the Senate in 96. I never used a negative ad. And the reason was it's a double-edged sword. It's, I called it the Red October effect. You fire the missile, it misses, and guess where it's going next? It's coming right back at you. And so there's a great degree of trepidation in, in throwing, just, you know, putting an ethics complaint forward, especially uh, in, the, in the cauldron of an election. So that alone is enough, I think, to temper judgment by candidates, good candidates especially, the ones we want to win and come up here and represent people. That's enough to temper it. Um, so I don't really, I don't see that the um, the filing of a complaint is going to have any effect that might be positive for a candidate anyway. It's risky. It's really risky. Everybody knows that. You've all run for office. You've all, uh, Representative Keeble, I know you've had some tough campaigns. And, you know, uh, the flyers are always much worse than the... Um, the ethics complaint. You know, what, what, what really was a problem for me in the one election I lost was my idea to combine towns um, as Weskinog. You know, the, the clarion call of Weskinog, that was a hell of a lot more effective than any ethics complaint ever could have been. Trust me. And, you know, pe- you go to people's doorsteps and they're like, what is the name of that town you want to create? And, you know, that alone is enough. I, that... The ethics complaints, really, it's, it's, not, it's not what you think. And I think you all know that. It's, it's, to me, it's self-evident. So, Okay, any other questions for former Representative Gorham? Thank you all very much. Can we hear from Pat Ford? Anyone else left in the room that would like to testify and has not done so? 
Okay, Pat, I think you're it. Well, we got one more. Sorry, sir. Very brief prepared remarks and then a comment on the moratorium. Uh, my name is Pat Ford, and I am chairman of the Rhode Island Retirement Party. Is that better? Okay. My name is Pat Ford, and I am chairman of the Rhode Island Libertarian Party and a proud member of the Clean RI Coalition. First, let me congratulate the General Assembly and particularly Speaker Mattiello for tackling ethics reform. No single issue is more contentious, particularly in a challenging political climate, than the perception of a conflict of interest. The Libertarian Party supports this legislation. With regard to the moratorium, we support the moratorium. It might surprise you since the Libertarian Party is clearly associated with First Amendment rights. Rhode Island led the nation in squashing slap lawsuits. In the same vein, last-minute politically motivated ethics charges have no place in the body politic. We would so suggest, however, going to a 60-day moratorium. The language changes referred to by earlier testimony are entirely appropriate. And adjudicate should be added, and language that's more appropriate to a statutory environment should be moved there. Now, with regard to the moratorium, I can think of a recent example of uh, Dawson Hudson. Uh, and my only political statement here, I'll say that the state of Rhode Island would be a very different place if Dawson Hudson was Attorney General. Uh, last minute, uh, sp specious ethic charges were, were laid at his doorstep, and I don't think that changed the election. But Representative Riley, Mr. Hudson, and any clean government reformer is equally the target of this type of last minute complaint as anyone else. Now, we have in this nation arguably the most transparent ethics system arguably, possibly around the world. It's being copied internationally. Ethics complaints are made public, uh, and the, the state is well aware of the ongoing developments. The, that is not true, for example, in New York, where the governor, for example, right now is involved in some very serious complaints. Um, you know, you don't know until you don't know. So I would argue that the moratorium is a critical part of the legislation. It is a double-edged sword, and I think it's important that we leave that in place intact, also in the spirit of negotiation that's taken place. Uh, six, seven years post Irons v. Ethics Commission, the opportunity to bring the uh, General Assembly back under the yoke, if you will, of the Ethics Commission is an opportunity that's too good to pass up. I applaud all the bodies in involved and their willingness to come to a compromise like this that's workable, and I certainly hope it passes. Thank you. Yes, Representative Flippy. Mr. Ford, nice to see you again, sir. This moratorium applies to both third-party initiated complaints mm -hmm. and those complaints that are initi initiated by the Ethics Commission. If, if there was a moratorium that just prevented third-party complaints from being filed, is that something that your group would, would accept where we would still have sure, complaints initiated by the Ethics Commission sua sponte? Absolutely. Being able I'm, to be brought. I, I mean, I'm, that I would absolutely be in favor of, given the, the long track record of the Ethics Commission. Um, but again, in the spirit of compromise and political necessity, I'll leave that comment hang. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Pat? Thank you. Sorry, sir, I, I must have missed your name. My name is, is this on? My name is Frank DiGregorio. Uh, I'm from the town of Exeter, uh, where I sit on the Exeter Planning Board. And uh, subject to the uh, uh, jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission, unlike the General Assembly as it now stands, uh, I've prepared a statement I'd like to read to you concerning uh, my opinions uh, on this uh, issue. Joint resolutions H8189 and H7577 both propose to put before the voters amendments to the Constitution of the state that, if adopted, would overrule the Rhode Island Supreme Court decision in Irons versus Rhode Island Ethics Commission and affirm the Ethics Commission's jurisdiction and authority over acts otherwise protected by a speech and debate uh, clause. It also would clarify the constitutional authority of the Rhode Island Ethics Commission to adjudicate all civil violations of Article 3, Section 8 of the Code of Ethics. 
I express my strong support for Joint Resolution H7577 with the language that historically been included in previous bills and supported by Common Cause Rhode Island since the Irons ruling. As a member of the Common Cause Rhode Island Governing Board, I successfully solicited resolutions from almost all 39 cities and towns in support of our position from 2012 through 2015. Since its first introduction, those bills, along with other bills addressing this issue, have been rejected by the General Assembly. In addition to H7577, there is now a compromise bill, H8189, before this committee for consideration as well. This compromise bill obviously has a better chance of passage with Speaker Mattiello being its prime sponsor. All elected official and appointed officials in the state of Rhode Island, with the single exception of the Rhode Island General Assembly, since the IAN's ruling, fall under the jurisdiction of the Rhode Island Ethics Commission for investigation and adjudication for noncompliance or violation of the Rhode Island Code of Ethics. It has worked flawlessly since the approval of the 1986 Ethics Amendment. Since the IAN's ruling, the Rhode Island General Assembly has not been held accountable for its activity, especially as it relates to conflicts of interest issues. It is not a secret that the members of the General Assembly, some much more than others, are unduly influenced or even accountable to the many powerful lobbyists and special interests that fill the Rhode Island State House hallways and chambers. Although Joint Resolution H7577 is the preferable of the two bills, I could support Joint Resolution H8189 in accordance uh, with suggestions by John Marion, Executive Director of Common Cause Rhode Island. However, most importantly, I strongly believe it should be amended to include and adjudicate following the authority to investigate to make it implicitly clear that the Ethics Commission has that authority. This directly addresses the Supreme Court's rationale in the IAN's ruling and does not rely on implication, which the Court has demonstrated an, incl an inclination to disfavor. That authority must not be implied but must be made explicitly clear. Otherwise, it could leave it to subject could leave its subject to being challenged again. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. On Representative, um, on Speaker Mattiello's Bill 8189, Linder and George Godspeed both signed up uh, without testimony in favor, as did Jonathan Keith, also in favor. I'm going to go through and review the written testimony for 8189. We have received a letter from Robert Benson, President of the Unitarian Universalist Legislative Ministry of Rhode Island, and he is in support. He has some issues with the moratorium. Uh, we do have a letter from the League of Women Voters as they mentioned, as we do from Common Cause. The Attorney General uh, writes in support of 8189, and the ACLU um, states that they have not had an opportunity to adapt a formal position on this important legislation, um, but they do raise two issues. The first is that speech and debate is an important protection for elected officials. And the second is that uh, relates to the moratorium. We have not had a chance to fully consider the civil libertarians implications of this proposal, but we'd like to make the following points. We recognize that individuals still retain the First Amendment right to raise concerns about ethical misconduct during election season. They are simply barred from filing formal complaints about it. They also understand that the purpose of this moratorium is to address the filing of frivolous complaints motivated by political purposes. On the other hand, election season is precisely the time when ethical conduct is most likely to be scrutinized by voters, the media, and other interested parties. So with that, we will conclude testimony on Speaker Mattiello's bill, House Bill 8189. And 
on Representative Marcello's Bill 7577. Jonathan Keith signed up in favor. Amy Gardner signed up in favor. And Steve Rackett signed up in favor, as did Daryl Gould. And Nancy Rhodes, all in favor. We received a letter from the Attorney General in support of Representative Marcello's Bill 7577. And Operation Clean Government also sent a letter in support. With that, we will conclude the hearing on House Bill 7577 by Representative Marcello. Those are our only bills this evening. Vice Chair Costa moves to adjourn. That's seconded by Representative Vigello. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for taking time out of your day to be here.